Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this morning we're continuing to look at um, the Holy Scriptures, uh, what the Holy Scriptures are, um, is, is our main focus. So we're going to be looking at point four um, and five today. Uh, so let me begin um, with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Father, we just pray that you would bless us now as we, as we consider the doctrine of your word, what it is that your word is, um, that we might rightly um, put our confidence and our hope in it. Father, we thank you for your love and your compassion. We thank you for the grace of God that has been delivered to us, that, that we have been redeemed and reconciled to you, and that you have given us your word that we might put our hope and our confidence in you. So, Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so number four, the authority of the Holy Scriptures for which it ought to be believed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the word of God. All right, so uh, the first thing we see there is that um, the Word of God does not get its authority from any man or from any church, all right? So anyone think they know what these uh, early reformers, what man they might be referring to, um, who might feel like he has the right to tell you what is Scripture and what is not Scripture? Pope. Yeah, the Pope, okay? So these early reformers, um, they were going against uh, Catholicism um, and the misteachings of the church and so the church believed that the Pope um, had ultimate authority on earth and so the Pope could declare whether something was scripture or not scripture all right but then you also have the church the Roman Catholic Church the councils um, that would come together and the idea here was is that the church does not does not give authority to the Bible but rather it recognizes God's authority and right, we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, later on right but then the next thing we see is that God is the author of the Bible okay um, so obviously we ascribe authorship human authorship um, to the Bible so for example uh, here a little bit later I'll be teaching from Colossians Colossians we ascribe authorship to the Apostle Paul right but in doing so we recognize that that God is the first author, um, that Paul was merely, uh, was the author, but he was the, the one who wrote it. So um, most people, most uh, conservative, uh, not only Baptist, but conservative evangelical Christians hold to a theory of inspiration called the verbal plenary inspiration, all right? So verbal means words, plenary means the absolute or uh, unqualified words and then inspiration has the idea that God has inspired it right now this is different from illumination so illumination is when you're either receiving revelation in general revelation looking at the world looking at the mountains the stars and they speak to you and proclaim to you the glory of God or when you are reading God's word and you come to understand something and it makes sense to you all right that's what we call illumination Inspiration has the idea, rather, that God himself is the one who is, is inspiring it and giving you the words to say. We see this from 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is breathed out by God, okay? So all of scripture, the Old and the New Testament, and we'll look at why we believe that in a minute, it is given by inspiration, right? So that the word of God is coming forth from God, okay? Now, um, every word of the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit so that the original writings were without error, all right? So we believe that when Moses was writing or a prophet was writing or any of the New Testament authors are writing, that God was carrying them along so that everything they wrote in those original texts were completely without error. They were infallible. They were inerrant, right? There was nothing wrong with them, all right? Now, <clears throat> a question could be asked, well, I'm not reading what Paul wrote, right? Uh, I'm not reading what Moses wrote. I'm reading an English translation 
of something that was passed down for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Is this reliable? Can I look at this Bible right here and know that when I read this, I'm reading God's word, okay? Uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later, all right? But right now, let's deal with what, why we believe that the original letters that they wrote were in fact inerrant, okay? First, um, but let's, let's first actually look at the, the theory of inspiration. So there are those who at times have taught about a theory of inspiration called dictation theory. So the idea is that God spoke and man just wrote down, okay? So a dictation exercise is when someone speaks and you write down exactly what they say. My children uh, will do that in school. The teacher will read something or say something and all they'll do is write it down word for word exactly like that, all right? That is not the theory of inspiration that most conservative evangelicals hold to. Now, there are times we believe that God speaks and man just writes down exactly what it says, but, but those times are explicit in the, in, the, in the Bible. It tells us, thus says the Lord, okay? And it's explicit, it's written in that way. But what we mean by, by verbal plenary inspiration is that God so inspires man to write so that every word is inspired by, by God, yet God operates under the, the vocabulary of that individual, the style of that individual, okay? So we believe that uh, God so inspires the teaching, the words, that they are his words, but underneath the same style. So if we read the book of John and we read the book of Matthew, two gospels, okay, two stories of Jesus, but very different, okay? Um, and yet we see that, all right? Now, there are some who would say that God gives ideas um, to writers and writers write about those ideas, but not every word is there, okay? Now, if we deny that, that the Bible is inerrant, that it's God's word, what are some, some, possible, um, some possible issues that might arise from that? We don't want to say that the Bible is inerrant. We say it has errors. Man was writing. God gave him a message. Man did the best he could to write that message down. But this isn't God's perfect word. What would be some, some issues that we might run into because of that? Every issue. Every it's issue. Huge. Huge issue. Can you give me like a specific? What you're, what you're talking about today is so critical because... We, we need it to be inerrant, mm -hmm. or else we can just interpret it however we wish, and we can get anything. We can make it say what we want it to say, and all these things. And uh, this is such a critical point that you're making today on, on, the, on the infallibility of Scripture. Uh, it's our bedrock, where we start, where we come back to. It's, it's everything. If, right. it's, if it's in error, if there's even the possibility of error, it's meaningless right. in many ways. Yeah. No. Yeah, it, you're right. It, it, the, the Word of God is the foundation. It is the bedrock upon which our entire faith is established. Okay? And so... There's contradictions all over the place. If we don't think there's an error, right? Like, does God love us? Or does he hate sinners? Yeah. Love all people, or does he want me to go to hell? Right. There, it's everywhere. All it's, not just, it's not just <clears throat> that we think it's inerrant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like if we think it is, then it makes it so. It's not that. It's that it is inerrant. Mm -hmm. And that we, therefore, are under its authority. Right. Yes. Yeah. And so like specific issues um, in that, we, that we see alive in our day is, is moral issues, all right? Uh, especially in, in our time of, of, of growing diversity in sexuality, right? Um, if, if God's word is not true, then how do we know what he says here or there about moral issues are right or wrong? Maybe lying is perfectly just in, in, in many situations, uh, right? Maybe God's word can't be dependent there, right? Uh, it raises faith issues. Who is God? Was, did, did, when, when Paul wrote that about God, 
Was that just Paul's interpretation? Or and maybe he's wrong there. Because, you know, maybe I don't like a God who has absolute sovereignty over those who will be redeemed and those who don't. And so I think Paul just got that a little bit wrong. That's scary, right? Ultimately, uh, we turn into Thomas Jefferson, right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, was not a Christian, but he did like the book. Uh, but there were parts of the book that he didn't like, not like, right? He did not like miracles. He didn't believe in miracles. He was a rationalist. He was a humanist, all right? But he liked the moral ideas, like, you know, love your neighbors yourself. That was good. So what did he do? He cut out parts of the Bible that he didn't like, right? If there's a miracle, nah, that doesn't fit with me, I'll cut it out. And so ultimately, who becomes the one with authority? Who becomes the God over what is true? Humanity does, right? And so that's why denying or rejecting the inerrancy of the Bible is wrong. But, but so why do we believe that the Bible is the word of God? Ultimately, we believe the Bible is the word of God because the Bible says it's the word of God. Right, so uh, I'm gonna go jumping through here. You probably won't be able to keep up with me because I've already tapped it off, so it's easier for me to turn there. Um, but so, some different things, okay? First, the New Testament says that the Old Testament is sacred. We see this in 2 Timothy 3 15, and how from childhood, speak Paul speaking to Timothy, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? So we see that they're, they're sacred. We see that they are also holy in Romans 1 and verse 2, um, which, uh, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the holy scriptures. Okay, So Paul's saying that the gospel would be preached, all right? that the apostle Paul would be set forth for the, for the gospel. All right? And this gospel was promised beforehand by the prophets in the holy scriptures. Okay, Holy having this idea of those writings which have been set apart. Okay, they are God's word. Next, we see that the Old Testament writings are received as the oracles of God. We, we had Jason teaching us this. Um, verse, uh, chap, uh, chapter 3, verse 2. Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. These messages, these words that came from God. Uh, we see in Acts chapter 4. Um, oops, I didn't do this one. Acts chapter 4, verses 24 through 25. Let me turn there. Acts chapter 24, verses 24 through and when they heard it, they, were, uh, they lifted up their voices to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth, the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, um, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. All right. So here we're quoting from a psalm. And yet here, this is what it says, that it was said by the Holy Spirit, right? So Luke is saying that, that God was the author, the Holy Spirit was the author here, right? Um, we also see that, that when the scripture says that these things are equivalent, that scripture, what God says and what scripture says are equivalent. We see this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 18. Oh, chapter 3, verse 8, sorry. Uh, verse 8, and the scripture, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Okay? And so here it's the scriptures that were foreseeing, right? Not God, but scripture had this idea of being for, of foreseeing. Uh, this was a great one I found yesterday. Um, Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. All right. So here um, the we're in the midst of, of the seventh plague and God tells Moses to go and say these words to um, to Pharaoh. He says to say these words to Pharaoh. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So Exodus tells us that those words come from God. But then in Romans 
chapter uh, chapter 9, verse 17, Paul writes, For the scriptures say to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Okay? So is it God saying it, or is it the scriptures saying it? Well, it's one and the same, because the scriptures are God's word. And so to say that the scripture says it is the equivalent of saying that God says it. Okay? Uh, we see that God is the author, therefore what was written of old can be for a future generation, right? Uh, it would be silly for me to write a letter to one of my children, assuming that that letter has purpose and value for their great, 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 great grandchildren, right? And yet what we see in the scriptures is that the things of old were written down for us in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, okay, on whom the end of the ages has come. And so Paul is saying all these things that were written in the Old Testament, okay, they were written ultimately for us who live in the end of the age. All right? That's not possible unless it has a divine author behind it. Um, Galatians 3.16, every single word is inspired by God, right? Listen to Paul here. He says, now the promise was made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your, to your offspring, who is Christ, okay? So here, God's made this promise to Abraham, right? And Paul is so particular, not that he's just trying to get the general idea of what Moses wrote down when God was speaking to Abraham, but Paul is so particular, one single word indicates that this was not referring to all of those who would be born to Abraham, but referred to one offspring who is the Lord, right? And so that's why when either Dan or Jason or I are teaching, sometimes we give a lot of detail and attention to a specific word because that word, that one single word was inspired and thus it has significance. Uh, we see that scripture is and will be fulfilled in John chapter 19. Um, it says, but, the, but one of the soldiers pierced his side. So Jesus is on the cross. One of the soldiers pierces his side and there... Uh, and at once there came out blood and water. He, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, there they will look upon him whom they have pierced. All right? So the scripture itself must be fulfilled. It is and will be fulfilled, right? Only God's word would be able to do that, right? Now, the New Testament authors believe that their writings, their New Covenant authors believe that their writings are equal to Old Covenant writings, right? So one of the challenges is, is yes, we recognize the authority, the God inspiration of the Old Testament, but maybe not the New. But here's some verses where we see um, where the Bible says that it is uh, God's word. In the doxology of, of Romans 16, verses 25 through 27, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the mystery that was kept secret for long, for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings have been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. And so Paul is saying, my writings, my teachings, and those of the prophets of, that, of his era, those who had sent out the word of Christ in that era, they are giving the more true and full interpretation of the things that were a mystery in the ages past. All right. The prophets of old prophesied truthfully, but they didn't even know the fullness of what they were prophesying and what they were teaching. But yet Paul and those with him have come in and they have brought this fullness. Uh, Second Peter uh, verses one through two. This is how the second. Uh, this is now the second letter I am writing to you, beloved. 
In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by, by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, right? So the apostles are the ones who are communicating the instructions of the Lord, and they are to remember those things, they are to obey those things. And lastly, uh, 2 Peter uh, 3.16, uh, speaking of Paul, uh, sometimes Paul's writings are difficult, right? So if you ever read some of Paul's letter and you're not quite sure what he says, that's okay. Um, that's been the way it's been since the beginning. Uh, and I'm actually going to start in verse 15. And count, um, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given, uh, given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures, right? And so by calling them, Paul's writing saying other scriptures, the implication is that Paul's writings that have been circulated around the church and received by the church, those two are scriptures, right? So we believe that the Bible is the word of God because the word of God as the Bible says it is, right? So what would be a, what would be an obvious objection to that claim? Well, circular reasoning. Circular reasoning, right? Okay, it's circular reasoning. Why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? I believe the Bible is the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God. Well, how can you believe that it's, that what it says? Because it's the word of God, all right? That's circular reasoning, all right? And so many will use this as a way to write off the argument, okay? But the reality is, is that every time you go to an ultimate authority, right? Whatever the supreme authority is, you always have to have circular reasoning or a circular argument, okay? So someone might say, well, I don't, I don't believe the Bible, right? I put my confidence in reason and logic, right? And so I, I think about something, I want to make sure about something, I study something as much as I can, and then I know that that thing is truth, okay? And I would say, well, how do you know it's truth? Well, because I've thought about it, and it makes sense to me, it's reasonable, it's logical, okay? Well, how do you know it's reasonable and it's logical, right? Because it makes sense. How does it make sense? Because it's, and it's circular reasoning, all right? Um, if we rely on our own experiences as our highest authority, right? I've never experienced that. Well, how do you know you're not going to experience that, okay? Um, in our world, uh, the scientific method, right? We want to rely on tangible evidence that we can see. Well, we're not going to believe anything that someone just says. We want evidence to support it, all right? But again, we have this reasoning. How can you trust the scientific method? Because, I, because, it, because it makes sense, because it, it gives me reasons. Well, how do you know that the scientific method isn't flawed? How do you know there's not something that you're missing, that there's data that you're missing? Um, sometimes we appeal to, to authority, right? Well, doctor such and such says it. Well, who says doctor such and such is right? Well, he says he's right. He's the expert in the field. Well, how do you know he's the expert in the field? Because he's Dr. Such and Such, okay? No matter what you do, whenever you appeal to ultimate authority, you're always going to have circular reasoning, right? There's no way to get away from that. You always will have this circular argument. The question then is, does the teaching of the scripture make sense with our experiences? Is it consistent? Does it have shortcomings, all right? And ultimately, when I've investigated the scriptures, when I see the scriptures that the world presents, the worldview it develops, the answers it gives, it doesn't have those things, right? Now, this is one of the craziest things about the Bible, right? If you read philosophies, okay, if you read the Quran, you would expect that the Quran, Quran would not have many inconsistencies, that, you wouldn't, that it wouldn't have many contradictions. Why would you expect the Quran probably not to have a whole lot of contradiction in itself? How many authors does the Quran have? One. Right? Now, Muhammad says that it was given to him as a revelation from God, but it has one author. Okay? So you would expect something written by one person not to have contradiction in itself. 
Yet the Bible has no contradictions. And we know that the Bible was written by at least around 40 different authors. It was written over a span of of around 1,500 years on three different continents, okay? How in the world could a book be written by 40 different people over a span of around 1,500 years on three different continents, and yet it contained no contradictions, okay? I think the only answer would be is that it is God-given. Well, the argument is it does have Yes. Uh, individuals will say they find contradictions, um, but those contradictions can be remedied and understood um, to varying levels. But still, the consistency of the Bible, even if we even if we were to say that it has minor contradictions, which I don't say, um, it's still a largely consistent book um, spanning such a, a large time. Um, so, now, this is where it gets hard then, okay? If we believe then, all right, and I, I hope I've effectively argued, if we believe that this is God's word, therefore, if we disbelieve anything that this book says, we ultimately disbelieve who? We disbelieve God. We disbelieve God. Because we yeah. And so if there's anything in here that we disobey, there's a command, an instruction, given in it, and we choose not to obey that command, then ultimately we're disobeying who? God, okay? Because if we receive this as God's word, then we receive this as not God himself, we don't worship the book, but we receive it as his instruction. And so to disbelieve any of the scripture is to to disbelieve God, all right? So the scripture then is our final authority, all right? Um, because we don't have access to go to God and receive direct instruction from him, anything the word says is our final authority, right? So us as a church, we have to do our best to to operate as a church, um, both in the way we organize and and act among ourselves, but also in the way that we act out there, right? In, In accordance to what the scripture says. It is our final authority. It is God's word given to us. All right, so then we have to get to this question, how do I know I have the word of God, okay? So again, it's one thing to make the argument that I receive that the original manuscripts, or the original autographs, the original things that the, the prophets and the apostles wrote, I'll just give it that, but how do I know that's what I'm holding right here? How do I know that I'm holding God's word? All right, so I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna talk about the New Testament first. I'm gonna go out of order, okay? So Plato's Republic, uh, so written by Plato, a book called The Republic, all right? It was written in around 400 BC, so 400 years before Jesus, all right? The earliest manuscripts that we have of that book come from AD 800, so 800 years after Jesus, okay? So that's about a 1,200 year span of time between when he wrote it and when our earliest manuscript is, okay? And when we found those original manuscripts, there were only seven of them, right? But almost no one denies that Plato's Republic was written by Plato, okay? Everyone basically believes that that's his book and we have it, all right? now. Homer's Iliad, right? Homer um, wrote in 800 BC, so 800 years before Jesus, so uh, an ancient. Um, and we have manuscripts from him from 400 BC. So there's only a 400 year gap in between there, right? And we have 643 copies. And when those copies are compared, they have a 95% accuracy, okay? So in a 400-year gap, those manuscripts have a 95% accuracy. So we can feel pretty confident that we have what um, what Socrates wrote, okay? So no one, no one, or not Socrates, I'm sorry, uh, Homer. No one denies that the Iliad was written by Homer, 
and that what we have is what Homer actually wrote. All right, now the New Testament. Okay, so let's, let's compare those ancient documents to the New Testament. The New Testament was written around 50 to 100 AD, right? So about 50 years between the, the earliest letters, probably written by Paul, um, to the latest book of Revelation written by, by John, okay? How do you gap? The earliest manuscripts we have come from AD 125, right? So the oldest, the, the manuscripts, the distance, the, the time between them, they were first written to the ones we have is only a 70, 25 to 75 year gap, right? Now remember the Iliad, we have 643 copies, okay? Or manuscripts of that book. The New Testament has over 24,000 manuscripts that tell us what the apostles wrote, what the book said. And when you compare those, they have a 99.5% accuracy, okay? And so we know that, that the Greek Bibles that scholars have put together, all right, and that our Bibles, uh, most of our newer translations are translated from, they are 99.5% exactly confident that they have the exact same words that were written by the apostles and the other New Testament authors. And where that 0.5% difference is, there's almost no theological concern. It has almost no bearing of any significance, all right? So if you're gonna accept Plato's Republic, Homer's Iliad, the Bible is way more consistent and we know that it's way more accurate um, than, than those because of the amount of manuscripts we have, all right? Um, so now let's, let's compare that to the Old Testament, all right? Now the Old Testament is different, okay? Um, the Old Testament we believe was completed somewhere around 400 BC, so 400 years before Jesus, but our earliest manuscripts don't come until 900 AD, all right? So there's a big gap there, around the 1300 years, okay? But then, and, and Amber brought this up, but then we had a really, really important archeological find. Do you remember what it was? You asked me about it? The Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? So then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls that were dated um, in the time and right before Jesus, okay? So then we're able to take those Dead Sea Scrolls and compare them to the manuscripts of 900 years later, all right? So now we have this 900 year gap between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, the manuscripts that we had before that. What's amazing is that over 900 years, those two um, groups of manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scrolls and what we had, 95% accurate, and almost all of the discrepancies were spelling changes. Just the way the word was spelled. The word was the same, it just had a different spelling to it, all right? And so we can be rather confident that what we possess, that the, that the manuscripts of the Greek and Hebrew that our translators used to, to make our English Bibles are, are really, really, really close to the things that the original authors wrote. And when there are small differences, they have almost no theological or significant impact, right? It doesn't change what we believe. There's nothing in there about a fourth member of the Trinity. I guess that'd be a quite a many. Um, there, there's, no, there's no writing that is, uh, challenges the creation of the cosmos. There's nothing like that. They're very small, minute uh, variances or differences, okay? Now, what about translations, okay? So, so there you have to do a little bit of study. Not all translations are, are, are equal. Um, and so some translations are better. Um, obviously, the King James Bible was a significant, important translation for a long time. But as, as language changes over time, uh, I think it's better to, to update and to use a more, uh, a more uh, in English that's more commonly spoken. Um, because if you read Shakespeare, um, which was written in that same time frame, sometimes you read Shakespeare and you think one thing, and Shakespeare meant something completely different, right? And that's just because language changes over time, right? And there are times when you have to, to wrestle with it, and you have to, to struggle with it, because one might say one thing and another one say another. But again, usually, where there are even discrepancies between our English translations, they have almost no significant impact 
on our theological understanding. There might be small, small interpretive changes, but nothing of which has, has a huge role, okay? And so that's why um, I and, and most conservative evangelicals, uh, most Southern Baptist churches, believe this is the Word of God. We believe it's the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God, and it proves consistent. We believe that there's good evidence to show that the manuscripts that our Bibles are translated from, that the, that the, the, the Greek books that are, have been created based on the manuscripts we have are reliable, okay? So this presents then a challenge to, um, to these early reformers, okay? So they believe that the authority of Scripture comes from the authority of Scripture, okay? And they don't want to say that a man or a church has any right to de declare something to be scripture, that rather what we're doing is recognizing scripture. So, so what is the role, okay? What is the role of the church in relationship to, to the scripture, okay? So we don't want to say that the Roman Catholic Church gets to pick and choose what, it, what scripture is, because if the Roman Catholic Church gets to pick and choose what scripture is, then who's the ultimate authority? The Roman Catholic Church, okay? But at the same time, um, you have what we refer to as radical reformers, all right? Uh, these were individuals like the Anabaptists, all right? The Anabaptists were, were saying that revelation from God did not cease with the giving of the Bible, but it was continuing, all right? And so they were believing that they were receiving direct messages from God, and they would tell people what God had said to them, all right? And so these, uh, these early Baptists, didn't want to, to have that going on either. And so they had to say that the church plays some role in, in recognizing the scriptures, right? So uh, number five says, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church of God to an eye and a reverent esteem of the holy scriptures, okay? So the testimony of the church has value. Uh, induced has the idea of to succeed in persuading someone, right? And it's meant to persuade someone to have a reverent esteem, all right? So the church plays a role in that we should be encouraging and promoting and trying to persuade individuals to believe that this book that we call the Bible is the Word of God, that they recognize it as the Word of God, then they give it the appropriate reverence it deserves as the Word of God, all right? We are responsible for doing that, okay? So what are some ways in which we can promote and encourage and try to convince people that this is the word of God? Because that's our, that's our role, right? We don't add anything to the word of God. We surely don't take anything away from it. But we do play a role in building up the promotion of the word of God. And so what are some ways in which we can, can do that? Obeying. Yes, obeying the word of God, right? I think that's one of living out the instructions and commands, the principles of the word of God. Um, when we live radically different from the world and the world recognizes that and then recognizes that we live this way because this book tells us to, all right? It shows to them that we believe that this is so true, that we're not going to live like the world. We're not going to pursue the pleasures and the enjoyments of the world, but rather we are going to obey what this book says. Good. So we live it. Get some other people in here. Maybe some, maybe some not to born children. How can we persuade people, convince people, that the Bible is God's word so that they give it the reverence it's due. Dan said we live it, we obey it. Yes. Yeah, I think I think showing that archaeological archaeological evidence is supporting it, I think that's good. And saying, listen, like it's not that I just believe this because I'm just blindly believing this, right? Um, but I have lots and lots of reasons to believe this and for, you know, I remember, oh gosh, I was young. I was a believer, so I was probably 18 or 19, and uh, there was this question, was David a real person? 
right? Like they were questioning, like, was the, was the second king of Israel a real person or was he just a made up myth? Um, and they were like, we don't know. And there were people, archaeologists were like, yeah, we don't, we don't actually believe that David ever existed. And then what did they find? They found inscriptions with David's name on it, proving that he was a king in Israel. So archaeological evidence. So living it, archaeology, archaeological evidence. History. Do what? History. Archaeology, history, prophecy. Prophecy, yep. All these are evidences yeah. that he is reliable. He's found. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I, I think another way we do it as, as a church is the preaching of God's word, right? So again, um, as I told you guys a couple weeks ago, if I ever get up there with a book different from this one, okay, but not necessarily this, this, uh, this exact one, but if I get up there with, with, with Shakespeare or Diary of a Wimpy Kid or um, some other book and I proclaim a message to you from that book, um, it's time for you to rebuke me, uh, and maybe show me the door. Um, if, I'm, if I'm getting up there with a newspaper article, um, and that's what I'm gonna what I'm gonna talk from. So the, the what the church preaches testifies to what the church believes, right? And so when whenever whether it's Sunday school, Wednesday night, our Sunday service, this is always the thing that our our message is around. Now there might be exceptions here and there where we want to share something about you know a missionary or something like that, um, but that's not preaching. That would just be talking about uh, someone who lived a life or something of that nature. But the the preaching of the church uh, testifies uh, a commitment to read God's word. Right? If we believe that this is God's word, and the only two times of the week we get it are on uh, Sunday and Wednesday. Um, we're not really showing the world that there's any true commitment to this. We're not giving it the reverence it deserves if this is our, our Wednesday night um, and, and Sunday morning book, right? Um, to be able to talk freely about it, okay? Um, and not only does that say in sharing the gospel, but when someone has issues, uh, for example, I, I, I happen to be eating dinner uh, at the uh, little Mexican restaurant right up the way, and um, the individual was working all by himself uh, because a, uh, he said a kid, I don't know the age of this individual, but he said this kid, the kids don't wanna work. And so he couldn't get anyone to come in and work. And so he was running the, the, the restaurant all by himself, all right? And so then we just started talking about, about child rearing. And, uh, and I told him, I was like, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian pastor. My kids don't obey. They get consequences, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child, okay? Now, he agreed with me, so it wasn't this controversial thing, um, but I just quoted scripture freely and as an authority, right? It was just obvious in the conversation that uh, this isn't just my own belief. This is what the Bible says. This is what I believe we should do. This is why I do it, right? And it was just freely shared. It wasn't... I wasn't nervous, I wasn't afraid, I wasn't like, well, according to the book of my religion, this is what I do. No, I just said, this is what the Bible says, this is how it should be done. And so I think those are some ways that we can, um, we can do that. I want to end with um, Hebrews chapter, chapter 4, verse 12, and then I will pray for us. So this is what God's Word says says about itself. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All right? And so the word of God is active, it's alive, it's God's word, we should respect it as such, and our lives should be transformed through it. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Father, we thank you for your word, for the truthfulness of it, the power of it. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be so filled with this truth that our whole lives would be, uh, be brought into line with what your word says. Father, we pray that in our, in our regular readings that you would highlight areas in our lives that there are discrepancies where we are not keeping the word 
um, as we should. Father, let us receive this book as your word, your commands given directly to us. Um, so Father, help us to, to, to give it the respect it's due and to, to honor you through obedience to it. Father, we pray that you would bless us now as we go to the main service and to uh, the worshiping you of, 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 through hymns and through, through prayer, to the reading of your scripture and to the preaching of your word. Grant us grace that we might uh, honor you and, and show our commitment and our faithfulness to you through uh, hearing, believing, and obeying the word of God. We pray this all in Christ's name.